uh, quickly to at least let you know that they're there. Um, I want to start with um, upcoming event this Wednesday. Um, I was this past week in Richmond, Virginia at our denomination's General Assembly. Uh, churches from around the com- country in our denomination gather on an annual basis in different cities, different city each year, um, to do the work of the church, um, to encourage one another, to find ways in which we can share in common mission together as churches that share a common confession of faith and belief in the scripture and what it says. Um, and so we were there uh, this past week. If you're interested in hearing more about it, hearing more about our denomination, maybe you've been someone who uh, has been connected with the PCA and our denomination for years and years, and you want to just kind of uh, get up to date with, okay, what was going on and what's, what's the latest on different things. Um, or maybe you're not that familiar at all with the PCA or with our denomination, and you want to learn a little bit more about it. This Wednesday evening, we're going to have a Calvary conversation. We do this uh, three or four times a year on different topics. Uh, there's pre-reading involved, um, and so if you're interested in coming, Um, and participating in this conversation, uh, sign up on the sheet that's in the foyer on the table, and and, and we'll email you uh, this week uh, a couple of articles to read in advance. That way we're all kind of on the same page. Uh, If email isn't good for you, I do have a couple of hard copies uh, with me copied uh, here, so see me after the service if you're you're interested in that. Uh, But one way or the other, sign up on the sheet and come on Wednesday evening. Now, uh, it was a real treat. Uh, this past week at General Assembly uh, to see someone honored at the assembly that is very, very dear to us here at Calvary. Uh, Rick Springer, um, who worships with uh, his wife Carol down in Glassboro now, they live in South Jersey, but for decades uh, was a ruling elder here at Calvary. Uh, And Rick, some of you may know, some of you may not know, served the General Assembly as sort of uh, chief of the floor clerks Uh, which is a huge job, organizing all the arrangements on the floor of the assembly, every paper that gets handed out, every vote that needs to be counted by hand, uh, all organized by a number of uh, floor clerks, all under the the uh, the, the command or the, or the organization of Rick Springer. Um, and it was really neat to see Rick honored at the assembly because he's going to be stepping down from that role after 40 years of doing that. Um, and so... I want to show you just a short clip. We were able to grab it off of the, uh, uh, the video from the assembly. What you'll see is uh, the moderator of the assembly appointing, this is what happens at the very beginning of the assembly, uh, appointing various people to various roles. And so as a matter of custom, they appoint Rick to his role. And then you'll see the stated clerk, Brian Chappell, from his seat sort of interrupt the moderator and say, may I just say a word? And he'll comment on... Rick, and then the assembly, you know, over 2,000 commissioners plus others who were there in the room give Rick a standing ovation. So let's see if we can play this and you can see this. And uh, then the chairman of our floor clerks, teaching elder Tom Stein, the vice chairman of the floor clerks, teaching elder Tom Taylor, and then chairman of the floor clerks emeritus, ruling elder elder Rick Springer, and then of course, teaching elder Larry Roth, who is our unsurpassed organist. Could we give those volunteers, please, a little appreciation? Thank you. Steve, I'm going to add a word. Thank you. Mr. Clark? And Mr. Moderator, um, Rick Springer is emeritus because he is retiring and because he has served as the chair of the four clerks for the last 38 of 40 years. So we are very thankful. The man in the white coat. One more. One more. So that's it. And you get a little picture of General Assembly. So if you want to talk more this Wednesday evening um, for our Calvary conversation. Uh, Next thing to note, uh, starting next Saturday, we're going to have an eight-week fellowship group that's going to start meeting for uh, for the summer. It's going to be on Saturday mornings from 9 to 10. Uh, Garrett Schall is going to be facilitating that, and there's a sign-up sheet for that uh, in the foyer. Uh, And then next Sunday evening, we had such a great time. Uh, Those that were able to be there this past Sunday night uh, for our Backyard Fellowship we're going to do another backyard fellowship. The Schumanns are uh, gracious enough to open up their home. And yes, they're really inviting everyone uh, who is able to come to their backyard, weather permitting, um, 
next Sunday evening, going to be a little volleyball. Uh, if you're not into volleyball, just hang out on the back porch and enjoy some dessert and, and refreshments. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet for that. Uh, what they asked is that, um, two things. So one, if you're able to sign up, you know you're coming, it helps them get an idea. Um, but they don't want that to be, in, you know, a, a, a prevent you from last minute kind of saying like, oh, I can come. Oh, I wonder if I should. I didn't sign up. Uh, they want as many people to come who are, as are able to come to come. If you're able to sign up in advance this week or next week, then, then do that. Um, but please, please come. Um, we're going to uh, note the Calvary graduates that are in there. We're going to find a Sunday where everyone is uh, together in the near future, and we're going to honor them and pray for them. But they're in the, in the bulletin. And then there's a couple of other upcoming summer dates, uh, two things where we're going to be working in our community, uh, the Firecracker 5 uh, race, the five-miler race, handing out water again uh, this year. That's going to be on Thursday morning, July 4th. The National Night Out in August where we go over to the police department and uh, have a table and hand out cookies and enjoy uh, being a part of the community there. Um, and then uh, at the end of August, August 25th, uh, we are going to have a fellowship service and we'll talk more about this, but uh, this is the uh, 70th year of Calvary. Um, and so we are excited to be able to celebrate that. It'll be that week in August. Um, that is the, uh, the 70th anniversary of the first event that, of what became ultimately Calvary Presbyterian Church. So mark that on your calendar. We're going to have a worship service that evening where we celebrate uh, what God has done among us. Uh, last thing I want to do, and I know I'm taking a little while in announcements this morning, but we're a family and we celebrate those that are not with us uh, and serving in other places like Rick. I also want to recognize Bobby Reeser. Bobby, come on up. Bobby joined Calvary a couple of years ago. Um, he graduated from Penn State, moved back to the area, got a job with Lockheed Martin, um, and immediately, um, in just a way that is a great model to everyone, you know, I, I want to join a local church found us, uh, became a member here. Uh, his job always held out the possibility of him being a part of a program where he would kind of start rotating to different locations. Um, I told him, joked with him, I was praying against it, but no, seriously, I wanted the best thing for him. And this past uh, spring, uh, he was accepted into the program, and so he's going to start um, in a couple of weeks, you know, and move, but this will be his last Sunday with us, uh, to Connecticut uh, for the first year of his rotational program that'll take him to Connecticut and then to different places probably in the United States uh, for his job. But I'm grateful uh, for the model. We've already talked about it. Like wherever you go, the first thing you do is you look for a local church, a congregation to be a part of. He was a model of that when he came back from school here. Um, and we are going to be praying as a congregation um, that he does that as he moves to Connecticut. But I wanted to pray for him this morning um, and just give you the opportunity to greet him afterward and, and wish him well. So let's pray for Bobby. God, we thank you for uh, your faithfulness uh, to uh, your church. Uh, we're thankful that you provide opportunities uh, for us to be able to connect with people uh, wherever we are and that you have placed your people all around this country, in Connecticut, in New Jersey, uh, wherever uh, you may call us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would put us with others who love you and desire to serve you. Be with Bobby as he goes to Connecticut. Help him, help him to do well in his work, to perform it in an excellent way that honors you. Uh, and help him to connect with a body of believers there who love you and can encourage him and where he can serve as he has served us here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you. Now, as we transition from um, our time of announcements and stuff to our worship service, let me invite you to close the or open the bulletin to the inside. Um, if you are uh, here as a visitor, this order of service allows you to sort of follow through what we're doing. Most of the elements will be up on the screen as well, and so you'll be able to follow there. Uh, we have nursery care for our youngest children up to age, uh, up through age three, up to the fourth birthday that'll be available during the sermon uh, teaching time. But aside from that, we welcome our, our children to be a part of our family. Uh, this is our family room where we gather to worship God together. We take that seriously. This is a place of worship, and yet at the same time, we welcome our families into it. So if there's a little squeaking, a little noise, then that's just part of being a family, and we are, we're grateful for that. So take a moment uh, and pray silently as we begin that God would be at work among us as we come to worship him this morning.
call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 92, verses 1 to 4. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Father, we thank you uh, that we can call you Father. On this day where we celebrate uh, the gift of fatherhood, we thank you that you are our model of care, of protection, of service to us. Lord, we pray that as we gather into your presence, we would declare your steadfast love this morning, that it would empower us to declare and to celebrate your faithfulness throughout the day and into the evening, that we would do it with music, that we would do it with prayer, that we would do it with the reading and the study of your word. That we would do it with our whole hearts and mind and strength for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This song that we're about to sing, which is appropriate for Father's Day, was written by a Presbyterian pastor and published in 1901, not long after the death of his newborn sons. His first and second sons had passed away. And so a grieving father uh, writes about the sovereignty of God. This is my father's world. Let's stand and let's sing together. turn to your order of worship or look at the screen behind me for our confession of faith. We're going to be answering two questions in our Westminster Shorter Catechism. We've been going through this idea of God calling effectually his people to himself, his work in our hearts that brings us to faith and the benefits that come from that. Last week we looked specifically at the benefit of justification and this morning we're going to look at adoption and what that means. So I'm going to ask the question and, ask, and invite you to respond with the answers uh, that are printed there. Let's start with this general question, question 32. Church, what benefits do they that are effectually called partake of in this life? They that are effectually called do in this life partake of justification, adoption, and sanctification, and the several benefits which in this life do either accompany or flow from them. All right, then specifically, what is adoption? Adoption is an act of God's free grace, whereby we are received into the number 
and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God. For those that are effectually called, your adoption is not pending. (laughs) It is final. It is finished. It has been completed by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. Let's stand and let's sing of that great finishing work of Jesus on our behalf. As the ushers come forward, I'm going to ask that uh, you guys would just take a seat in that front row. I, have, I, uh, I made a shift, didn't tell the ushers, um, I made a shift in the order of service consequence of me not paying attention being away last week, but I want to do the missions moment first uh, because I think it's a logical lead in to our offering. Uh, every year from Mother's Day to Father's Day, we collect a special offering on top of the gifts that are used to support the local, uh, this church, uh, we collect an offering that supports two crisis pregnancy centers, uh, one to the south of us in Tom's River, one to the north of us in Shrewsbury, um, that help women and families in situations where they aren't sure what to do. They're faced with a pregnancy uh, and they need help. Uh, They need help with material needs. They need help with understanding how to navigate the world around them. And we do it from Mother's Day to Father's Day uh, because both mothers and fathers are integrally involved in the ability uh, to care for situations like this. In fact, one of the things that they have found is one of the greatest deciding factors in a woman, a young woman, or a woman faced with an unplanned pregnancy, deciding to carry that pregnancy to term 
is the willingness of a father, married or not, but the willingness of the father of that child being willing to stand up and say, I will take responsibility, I will help you care for this child. And when that happens, there is a much, much greater likelihood of that child being carried to term. I want to show you a short little video uh, that gives you a little bit of perspective of these uh, organizations that we support, and then we're going to pray specifically for them as we conclude our offering for baby blessings. When I first found out I was pregnant, I knew that abortion was the only option that I really could handle at that time. I felt completely overwhelmed and terrified. I knew that there was no way that I could raise a child, so I really did feel like abortion was the only possible outcome in this situation. I knew that time was running out, so I did go into the clinic and made the appointment to see the doctor. Uh, sitting outside the abortion clinic in my car, I decided to Google the pregnancy center. When I went to the pregnancy center, um, I had told the ladies my decision to go to the abortion clinic. Um, they knew the situation and they knew what I was worried about. They talked me through different options of what I could, could possibly do. Um, they were very welcoming and very warm. They did offer me a free ultrasound. At first, I didn't want to take it because I knew that would probably solidify a decision, but in the end, I did. When you do hear the first heartbeats of your baby, um, as a mom, it makes it real, it makes it true, it makes you realize that there is another life, it's not just you. That was ultimately what helped me choose to keep my daughter and to choose life. They gave me strength, they gave me hope, and ultimately my daughter is here because of them. So we have um, been collecting When a, you give, uh, your gift helps little ones. We've been collecting some change. Now obviously the primary way in which uh, uh, we've been receiving offerings as people writing checks or going to our website and using the drop down menu and you can do that again today make sure that it's designated for our baby blessing offering um, but historically a lot of this offering has been done through little bottles and people collecting change and we've had a big bottle in the uh, in the foyer where people have been putting change and money into that so thank you for bringing this up let's pray how about we do that you want to hold that come on here guys and let's pray for this and for our uh, our offering as well so we'll transition right from praying for the baby blessing offering, uh, to praying for our general offering, and then we will receive that together. Father, we thank you for uh, the way that you care for us, uh, for the life that you have given to us and the families in which you've placed us. Uh, we thank you for solutions and for open uh, door. We pray, Lord, that you would just uh, use those organizations uh, to love women, to love family, to love, love families, to love fathers, uh, to help to point them to the resources that are available, the hope that is available in Jesus Christ and through his church. We pray that these offerings would be used to support uh, those ministries. We thank you for the generosity of your people uh, to support the work of this local congregation. May we continue, Lord, to use the resources that you provide through your people for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm excited to have uh, Jonathan Hatt with us this morning. Jonathan, come on up. Um, we are going to be uh, hearing uh, God's word brought by Jonathan this morning. Now, if you were here, oh, I don't know, three or, three or four weeks ago? How long is it? Three weeks ago, Jonathan was here as part of our May Missions Month. He presented during our Sunday school. Uh, he is the uh, campus pastor for Reform University Fellowship at Rowan University. 
uh, or at least very recent campus pastor, uh, just uh, joined the, uh, uh, the, uh, the organization, the mission there. And uh, I invited him back uh, this week to preach for us as we uh, open God's Word. So we'll take a break from our study that we've been doing in 1 Corinthians uh, 8, 9, and 10. And he's going to have us in Jonah chapter 1 this morning. Um, Jonathan did not have these when he was here a couple weeks ago. They're on the table in the foyer. I'd invite you to grab one. Uh, little cards uh, that have a, information on the back about how you can get on to his newsletter, hear about what God's doing on the campus of Rowan, pray for Jonathan. Uh, there's a website, there's a phone number, uh, and a little uh, QR kind of a, a scan code there that you can use to go directly to where you can sign up. So let me pray for Jonathan as he brings us God's word this morning. Father, we thank you for RUF. Uh, we thank you for uh, the work specifically at Rowan, uh, for the 15, 16,000 undergraduate students and rapidly growing uh, that are there. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, open their eyes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you would bring revival to that campus, that you would do it uh, through the work of RUF and the other Christian organizations that are there. Uh, we thank you for those that have uh, seen the opportunity and stepped into the harvest of people in, um, in that stage of life to be able to share the gospel with them, to encourage those who are already followers of you, uh, how they can live in a world uh, that may be filled with challenge, but where there is great opportunity to be a servant of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we pray for Jonathan as he brings us uh, the word this morning, as he reads to us the scripture, as he preaches from it. Open our hearts to see exactly uh, what you want us to see, and may we run into your calling and not away from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, thank you, brother. If you would turn in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1. In Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. If you are using your pew Bibles, it is found on page 982. <clears throat> Before we read God's holy and inerrant word, I ask that you would take a time where we can pray for God to illumine our hearts in the hearing of God's word. Father, would you open our eyes to see glorious things from your word this morning? May you make us attentive where we need to hear the message of Jonah. <clears throat> May you unsettle us and make us uncomfortable where we have grown complacent and apathetic towards our sin. And Father, I pray that you would bring us comfort from your word, showing us your son, Jesus Christ, the greater Jonah in all of his glory. We pray this in his name. Amen. Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, hear God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship and into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, 
let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you? that the sea may quiet down for us, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. What is your picture of an Old Testament prophet this morning? Perhaps it's their background. You, you think of someone like Amos. Amos who once said, I was not a prophet. I was not the son of a prophet. Rather, I was a herdsman taking care of sycamore figs. Or maybe... Maybe you think of their imagery. You think of someone like Ezekiel, who if Pastor Tom did a sermon series going through the grotesque and graphic imagery that Ezekiel uses of idolatry and what it means to Yahweh, you might start getting a little uncomfortable. Or maybe... Maybe it's their emotions. Maybe you think of someone like Jeremiah who in his book he is often depicted as weeping and wailing over his beloved city Jerusalem, her disobedience, her destruction. <laughs> or maybe, maybe it's just the fact that they all seem to have this queer way of talking as Martin Luther once said, they ramble from one point to another, not seeming to have a logical flow, and that is actually because they come from the same office that Moses established in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18. Or most likely, since we have just read his story, you're thinking about Jonah. Jonah, one who is not even called a prophet in in his own book. One who is depicted as petty, vindictive, angry against God and everyone around him. For our time today, that's God's prophet. His story is so simple, Veggie Tales could make a movie about him. He's so well known that if you were to go to Rutgers University or Rowan 
ask random students on the street for two facts about the Bible, and they know two facts about the Bible, it's usually that there is someone named Jesus in there, and at some point, somewhere, I think someone gets eaten by a fish. So what's so important about Jonah? Why is it that we always come back to his story? Well, for our time today, Jonah is serving us as a case study. He, he's a warning, if you will, of the extent in which we fall when we seek to flee God and his commands. If you're looking for a question to be going through your mind as you are listening to God's word, this is the question Jonah chapter 1 is asking all of us. What is my response when God speaks to me? Again, for our time with the book of Jonah, the book is asking us one simple question that should be going through all of our minds today. What is my response when God speaks to me? We see how the prophet has responded. Look at your Bibles again. It's a very simple and straightforward beginning in verse 1 where the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, the son of Amittai. And these words are actually three commands. Three commands that you're going to hear again and again and again. What are they in verse 2? The Lord comes to Jonah telling him to arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city. Call out against it. He is told to get up, leave for Nineveh, preach against all of them. Even if he is skeptical, even if Jonah isn't really sold on this missions trip, God gives him a reason. He says, Jonah, their evil has come up before me. Maybe easy for us to miss the background that is here, happening here in Jonah, but you also might know your Old Testament well. Because the question running through our minds in verse 2, who are the Ninevites? Well, according to 2 Kings 17, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire that conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 B.C., that's actually Jonah's people. Or maybe we can think about the ancient Near Eastern literature telling us about the Assyrian Empire, where they were infamous for taking POWs, chopping off their right hands, gouging out their eyes. They were brutal and heinous to what they did to the people that they subjugated. Even going beyond this, think about our biblical theology. Think about what the Bible is leading us to because as the Assyrian Empire conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, they brought foreigners into the land, particularly Samaria. And as the foreigners are remaining in the land, they begin to intermarry with the Israelites that remain. And generations pass of these intermarriages, cultural's, culture begins to mix, and before you know it, by the New Testament, we actually have a separate group of people, the Samaritans. These would have been the most wicked, most heinous people on the face of the earth of Jonah's time. And that's the nation that Jonah is being sent to. Even beyond this, this would have actually been a death sentence for Jonah because let's make a contemporary example of what Jonah was essentially doing here. This would have been the equivalent of Martin Luther King Jr. going by himself at the height of Jim Crow laws to a Klan rally 
and preaching against all of that. Jonah's trip would most likely lead to his death. So it's easy from a human perspective to to get into the mind of Jonah, to, to understand why we ourselves would want to run from this call. Because look at what Jonah does in verse 3. He does arise. He follows God's first command perfectly well. But what does Jonah do in verse 3? Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. To give you an idea geographically of what's happening here, Nineveh was about 500 miles from Jonah. Tarshish is 2,500 miles from Israel and in the complete opposite direction of Nineveh. Jonah is making it abundantly clear that he will have nothing to do with God's call. In fact, it even goes to great lengths in verse 3 to show us the extent in which Jonah is trying to flee God's command. Because not only does he rise to flee, but he actually goes down to Joppa. He finds a ship going to Tarshish. He pays the fare, goes into the ship to go with them away from the presence of the Lord. And at this moment, you've heard the story so often. You've seen the movie of Veggie Tales. You're thinking, Jonah, that, that's asinine. That is idiotic. That is the stupidest thing you can possibly do. Haven't you read your Old Testament? Haven't you read the Westminster Confession of Faith? Haven't you read John Calvin? Don't you know there is nowhere you can go to escape God's presence? And yet how often do we say to ourselves... No one heard what I just said. No one knows about my anonymous Twitter account and what I say to strangers online. No one really cares about how I treat my family the second I leave Calvary. So long as no one's feelings are hurt, there's not really any harm done. How often do we practically live just like Jonah, imagining there is a discreet, concrete part of our lives that we can live apart from the presence of the Lord? Or maybe, maybe you might be asking, Jonah, don't you know that when God calls you to do something, it doesn't matter if you hate the Ninevites, it doesn't matter if they are the most detestable people in the world, you are to respond in obedience. And yet, who are the Ninevites in your life? Who are the people you would go to the ends of the world to escape? You don't even have your right arm in danger. You don't have your eyes in danger. You don't even have your life in danger. You just don't really like the Ninevites in your life. You just don't really connect well with the Ninevite in your life. You plan your schedule around them. You do everything you possibly can because the Ninevite in your life they may be wicked, they may be heinous, but they're not my problem. What's so funny about the story of Jonah is he does everything he possibly can to escape God's presence. What do we see in verse 4? That he goes to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord, but it is the Lord who hurled a great wind upon the sea. And there was a mighty tempest upon the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Jonah would see that storm. He would watch it coming upon the ship and he would immediately be reminiscent, probably saying to himself, Psalm 139, where shall I go from your spirit? 
Where shall I flee from your presence? For us, that's a great comfort. Psalm 139 is one of my favorite psalms or chapters in the entire Bible. We stitch it on pillows. We post it on Instagram and Facebook. We take great comfort in the truth that no matter where we go, we have the sovereign creator of the universe right there with us. But for Jonah, who is a disobedient prophet, doing everything he can to escape God, that storm is not a promise and sign of God's protection. That's an indication of God's ire and indignation. He's expecting that God is bringing down his very wrath upon Jonah for being disobedient to this command. In fact, Jonah going down into that ship is not him taking a cat nap to sleep off the storm. Because Jonah knows that that storm is from God, he hopes that the ship goes down. And he is the very first person to die. Jonah, from our story and what we have read of him so far, is responding abysmally to God, to God's commands. What's my response when God speaks to me? Well, we've seen the prophet. We've seen Jonah, but we have just read this chapter, and you know this story very well. Who else is in chapter 1? It's not just the Israel prophet. Who else is responding to God? Well, what are the Gentile sailors doing in our story? Well, when the storm comes, according to verse 5, it is the mariners that are afraid. It is the mariners that are hurling cargo over the ship. The mariners are crying out to every god they know because they know this storm is coming from a deity. They know there's someone to appease. In fact, go down a little bit. Jonah's taking his nap, waiting to die. But who is the one actually coming to rebuke Jonah to his face? But actually the Gentile sailor. The chief sailor himself but you may have missed this, because look closely at what the chief sailor actually says to Jonah. What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. What is that but actually the very words of God himself? Back in verse 2, reminding Jonah of those commands at the very beginning of this chapter to arise, go to Nineveh, call out against them. In fact, by the end of our story, what are the sailors doing when they realize there's nothing they can do to save Jonah? They've done everything they can to escape this storm. Look at verse 14 these Gentile sailors begin to sound like they can enroll in Westminster Theological Seminary next week. Because what is the prayer? What exactly are they saying but a prayer of God's sovereignty, of his control over everything? O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done as it pleased you. By the end of chapter 1, it is the mariners that are fearing Yahweh. It is the mariners that are offering sacrifices to Yahweh. It's the mariners that are actually making vows to Yahweh. Isn't this just even a lesson for us this morning 
of how often we want to think the only way God can speak through other people in my life is when I have my Bible open, of course, but when the person coming to counsel me has an MDiv behind his name, is a ruling elder in my church, is a fellow Christian speaking to me. And yet, what we see very clearly in chapter 1 is that God is perfectly willing to use people outside the church to teach the church a lesson. But again, ask that question that Jonah chapter 1 is asking all of us. What is my response when God speaks to me? Well, what we've seen in chapter 1, two different people responding to God in radically different ways. But the irony of Jonah, the thrust of this chapter for all of us this morning is this. As believers, you are to respond to God not like his prophet, but like those sailors. Because, again, ask yourself, who are the Ninevites in my life? Who are the people I would go to the very ends of the world to escape? I plan my schedule around them. I do everything I can just to minimize the time they have in my life. Or maybe... It's not that I have this hatred like Jonah. I don't detest people in my life. I'm not a bigot. I just don't really like the Ninevite in my life. I just don't know how to have small talk with that Ninevite who I have absolutely no connection with. Or maybe it is that extreme. Maybe it is that you're actually looking forward to God's judgment on that person. And it's not out of a zeal and jealousy for God's holiness, his righteousness, and his justice. But you just cannot stand what that person did to you. And if there is any justice in this world, God must bring down his judgment upon that person. Isn't it ironic that in the book of Jonah, the only people that seem to actually get who God is in the entire book are Gentiles. Because chapter 1, we see the Gentile sailors responding to God, bringing faithfulness, repenting, and coming to him. But if you know your story well, Jonah actually does show up in Nineveh. And by chapter 3, he gives the shortest sermon you can possibly imagine. But what happens to the city of Nineveh? The king takes on sackcloth, sackcloth and ash. The city takes on sackcloth and ash. Even the animals themselves are taking on sackcloth and ash. They are repenting. They are turning to God. What is the Israelite prophet doing? Well, in chapter 4, he is whining and complaining. He is demanding God's judgment upon every single one of those Ninevites that has destroyed his people, that has destroyed his nation, that he absolutely detests. Well, who are the Ninevites in my life? that I have the same spirit of Jonah, that the last thing I can possibly imagine is for them to actually find Jesus. And what we see in this entire book is that if the most wicked and heinous of cities could find Jesus, could repent of their sin, how much more is that true for those that we hold these petty, vindictive anger and hatred towards? 
We are to ask ourselves, who are the Ninevites in our lives? But second, remember what we said at the beginning, that Jonah is a case study for us. He's not someone that we are meant to envy. He is this counterexample throughout the entire book of how we are to respond to God when he is speaking to us. In fact, Jonah, when we look at his life, all the way back in chapter 3, when he is first fleeing from God, it tells us that he goes down. And actually, if you were very closely looking at that chapter, it kept saying that Jonah went down. And it down and down. And Jonah keeps going down until he actually finds himself in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 6, but where does Jonah go but to the roots of the mountain, to the bars of Sheol itself? He is self-destructing his life, doing everything he possibly can to escape this one call God has given him. In fact, if you turn to chapter 4, Jonah tells us the exact reason why he ran. It's not out of a fear for his life, his arms, his eyes. Jonah knows who God is. And he blurts it out right to God's face in chapter 4, verse 2. O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. The greatest fear of Jonah's life is that Nineveh might just possibly repent. And the people that destroyed the nation of Israel, the people that have probably taken his family, his friends, those that he loved so much, are the last people he wanted to find forgiveness for. And he would sooner destroy his own life, flee from God, flee his very office, than bring this message of judgment to the nation of Nineveh. And so often, when we seek to emulate our lives just like Jonah, living a life of ignoring God, disobeying his commands, doing everything we possibly can to avoid his call in our life, so often we are going to find ourselves in the exact same place as Jonah, alone, in a desert, bitter, angry against God and everyone around us. But finally, Jonah actually leaves us needing a better prophet. Because we've been alluding to this whole book. How chapter 1 ends is he does throw himself, he offers to throw himself overboard for these sailors. And we imagine ourselves, or we imagine the story thinking that this is this selfless giving of his own life for these sailors. Yet even with this one thing, knowing everything we do about Jonah, he is still trying to flee God, to flee his commands, to do everything he can just to make sure Nineveh does not hear this message. He thinks the book is going to end in chapter 1, where he dies And this is simply a story of disobedience. And yet, what does God do in verse 17, what is perhaps the most famous verse in this entire book? That it is the Lord who appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. If you would turn in your Bibles to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 12, 
Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 38. It's on page 1039. That this is in the midst of Jesus' public ministry. <clears throat> he has offered miracles. He has brought repentance to people groups, to the nation of Israel. And in the midst of this public ministry, Jesus is actually meeting with the scribes and the Pharisees, who in verse 38 asked Jesus a simple question. Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. And that question, or that request, is actually a loaded statement because they are essentially telling Jesus prove that you are the messianic king that we have been waiting for that the Old Testament prophesied we'll be the first people to worship you we will be the evangelists going out to the nation of Israel sharing this great message that the king has come that God has sent his messiah but what does Jesus actually do Jesus doesn't give them a sign. Beginning in verse 39, Jesus gives them a story. Because what does Jesus say in verse 39 of Matthew chapter 12? An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jonah fails as a prophet that brings repentance. Jesus opened his public ministry with repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jonah fled the wicked Ninevites. Jesus publicly confronts the Pharisees and the scribes to their face, saying that those Ninevites are going to condemn you at God's judgment. The city of Nineveh only receives temporary reprieve from God's wrath because if you know your Old Testament well, two books later in Nahum, they're obliterated from the face of the earth. Jesus, because of his death and resurrection at the cross, has fully and climactically paid the penalty of sin forever. Jesus has made it his life's work to be the greater Jonah, the prophet most willing to bring this message of repentance. And for every single one of us in this room, whether you consider yourself like that prophet Jonah, who every stage of your life is disobeying God, fleeing his commands, doing everything you can do to escape his presence, or you're just like the Ninevites, wicked, heinous, unworthy of redemption. Jesus is that prophet, is the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, made flesh, who lived that life we could not live, died the death that our sins and ourselves deserve, was vindicated as that Messiah, and is now in heaven, offering this redemption, this very forgiveness of sins where we can have a renewed relationship with God. And this even gives us implications for what the entire book of Jonah is telling us. Because if you think back at that book, as I said, Jonah is a terrible, he is the worst missionary in the entire history of the church. But when you actually look at his track record, when you look at chapters 1 through 4, even when he is responding to God abysmally from the very beginning to the very end, 
What actually happens in that book? The Gentile sailors repent. The entire wicked city of Nineveh repents. But Jonah is just an example for us this morning that the call in our lives is not to clean ourselves up, to present ourselves as these bringers of repentance, but to be going to those Ninevites in our life and pointing them to that greater Jonah, Jesus, who was the only one capable of actually bringing repentance, bringing forgiveness to the most wicked and to the most disobedient of people. Because what's your picture this morning of an Old Testament prophet? Of all of those examples we have seen and we have talked about, at times it might feel just like Jonah. And at times we might sympathize and feel ourselves in the same place as Jonah himself. Where we cannot respond to God properly. Where we just have this continual life of failing him again and again and again. Or maybe we're just like the Ninevites. Where we can clean ourselves up and present ourselves well at Calvary and with other Christians. But when push comes to shove and when people know what is happening in our lives, that we are no better than those Ninevites. What I hope that you see in the book of Jonah is that this entire book is pointing us to that prophet, to the Son of God himself, Jesus, the greater Jonah, who is the only one willing to give his very life for the most wicked and disobedient of sinners like ourselves, and that we know through his life, because of what he has done, we can actually respond to God just as he has called us to do from his Bible. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have given us the book of Jonah, giving us these extreme examples giving all of these pictures of what we are called to do. No matter who we are today, no matter how, where we find ourselves, I pray that we would be looking to that Savior, Jesus, the one who has given his very life for us. We pray this in his name. Amen. stand as we sing together a lesser known but a powerful hymn from John Newton, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. Let's stand and let's sing together.
thank you for bringing us uh, God's word this morning. I hope that you'll take a chance to greet Jonathan as you go, and I hope you'll take a chance to greet one another as you go. Uh, but as you go, I want you to go with God's blessing, receive his benediction. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen.